Alrighty folks, and welcome to the Chronicler Podcast Channel. Episode 15, The War and States Period. Hello one and all, and I hope that you've enjoyed the Lunar New Year, and I hope everyone has a fantastic new year. The year of the cow dies, or the year of the ox, whichever way you want to call it. Now, you'll be glad to know, based on the title, that we are finally out of that sludgy mess that is the spring and autumn period, and we have moved on to the War and States period. The two Chinese names for these periods are Chunqiu and Zhangguo. Now, Chunqiu is spring and autumn, Zhangguo is the War and States. Now, the War and States period, like the spring and autumn period, was a complete mess, but interestingly, in different ways. Now, before I go on, I think I better refresh people's memories of the time frames we are talking about here. So the spring and autumn period is around the dates of 771 BC to 476 BC, whereas the War and States period is around 476 BC to 221 BC. Now the thing is, this time from when it starts usually depends on who you ask. The time frame is disputed. However, I'm only going to glaze over this. The time frames, as much as they are important, I feel in this case it isn't the biggest deal. What is the biggest deal, however, is why the transition? Why was this the moment where we transitioned from the spring and autumn to the Warren States? What was this line in the sand where people could definitively say, okay, this is the spring and autumn period and this is the Warren States period? Well, it came around because as the spring and autumn period came to a close, This process of fragmentation of the former Joe states began to reverse itself, and the smaller states were gobbled up by larger ones. And as well as that, during this time, everyone was claiming to be fighting for the Joe kings, or Zhongguo, the central state, which, quite funnily enough, is the Chinese name for China today. It literally means the Middle Kingdom, etc., so that's where it comes from. But by 476 BC, these states, which were much larger than the Joe, simply declared themselves to have had the mandate of heaven. And the first state I believe to do this was the state of Chu. The duke at the time basically said, I don't want to be a duke anymore, I want to be a king. And in Chinese, the name for king is Wang. So basically he said, I want to be a big Wang. Now the state of Chu were at the southern periphery of all these other states and were considered to be barbarians pretty much. So you know what the other northern states had to do, right? Yep. Basically, they asked themselves, if the state of Chu can become a big Wong, then I want to be a big Wong. So then it probably went something like this. I'm the big Wong. No, I'm the big Wong. I don't think so. I am the big Wong. Okay, you get the idea. Anyway, that's how it started. That's from what I've read anyway. That is the definitive moment from when we leave the spring and autumn period and we move into the war and states period. Now, some other sources say that it started with the partition of the state of Jin, a pretty powerful state in the north. And basically what happened there was that there was a big gold civil war within the state of Jin which then fragmented into the states of Wei, Han, and Zhao, who could all at least last until the Warren States period came to its final end in 221 BC. But we'll get into that later on. Now, if you just Google a map of the Warren States period, you're probably going to see a bunch of similar but different images. And that's because all of the different states had great campaigns, and then lost the territory and it kind of swung back and forth like a giant pendulum. Basically what you can say is that it turned into a bit of a stalemate after a while. Now for example, in 379 BC, King Wei in the state of Qi, remember that one, in modern Shandong province, launched a few campaigns to the north and the west, and he was very successful. 
and Qi was one of the most powerful states under his reign. But like I said, that's just one example. The state of Chu did it, the state of Wu did it, and then eventually the state of Qin did it, which then unified everyone. But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So now then, what I want to try and focus on mostly in today's episode is 1. How the scale of the battles changed and 2. How technologies evolved as well as battle tactics. And finally, I think it would be a good way to portray uh, at least one battle. Uh, One battle that I read about anyway, just because it would be good to show how the tactics were used in ancient China and how this was almost like an everyday occurrence, in historical terms anyway. So, during the spring and autumn period, there were a lot of battles, which we already kind of knew, but these battles were probably in numbers of the tens of thousands, you know? Still fairly large, but not as large as nowadays wars, and this was due to the population sizes at the time. However, one thing changed all of this. Iron. Iron made its way over to China during this time, and the metal found its way onto farming tools, as well as weapons, but for now, let's focus on the farming tools. The tools before were rather primitive, and crop yields wouldn't be very large. It it would always be either just enough to sustain the population of each state at the time, or there wouldn't be enough. However, iron allowed for agricultural surpluses now, And if there's more food, usually what tends to happen is that there is more people. It is estimated that China's population during this time increased from 12 million up to 40 million. And it was just as well for those new rulers or these new states who had openly declared the mandate of heaven needed more men to fight in their armies. So pretty much overnight, The sizes of these armies went from tens of thousands up to hundreds of thousands, quite literally. Even during Sun Tzu's time, in The Art of War, he mentions armies of a hundred thousand, as if it's nothing. He could even calculate the costs of such armies, which is just crazy. Now speaking of The Art of War, Sun Tzu came from the state of Wu, which was at the mouth of the Yangtze River. And the state of Wu, like their neighbours to the west, Chu, were considered barbarians by those northerners. However, they would have been pretty sorry after turning their nose up at them, as by 506 BC, we were marching and conquering everywhere. Their biggest target was their neighbours to the west, the state of Chu. And the reason why is probably due to a balance structure thing, because the state of Chu was very large. So in order to balance out power, Wu decided to invade. Now, I read a funny story over how the war broke out. Normally, a war could break out over stealing a princess, or a king was assassinated, or a new king has a claim to another king's throne. All of these things lead to war, right? Have you ever heard of mulberry trees leading to a war? Well, now you have. Wu went to war with Chu over friggin' mulberry trees. The Wu army invaded, won five battles, and then humbly sacked the Chu capital, Yi. As much as this was a great victory, and was unprecedented, it was the high point of the Wu state. And what comes up must eventually come down, and the state of Wu came crashing down shortly after. Now, this is just in the south. Wars like this were happening all over the place at the time, but I will focus on the south briefly for these rather interesting points that I've came across, just to emphasise how brutal these wars became. So when the state of Wu went on their wee rampage, which ultimately led to its own destruction, they used conflicts in battle as suicide units. The most notable was in the Battle of Kofu in 518. 300 convicts were lined up in the front and launched an attack against the Chu army. So the Wu army's main force had the time to set up camp, whereas their enemies didn't. So there you go. And the thing is, like, did any of these convicts survive? 
No, of course they didn't. They were all either beheaded, or if they were captured, or they were killed in combat. Most likely the latter. So the state of Chu, after the sacking of their capital, did manage to rebuild and launched an invasion of Wu. Now in order to rebuild the army, Chu actually allowed prisoners to join the army. Actually, that's being too kind. Let me rephrase that. The state of Chu forced prisoners to join the army, and they acted pretty much as cannon fodder or suicide units, whilst the real professional army could mop up after the chaos of the prisoners, which were just ran rampant in the enemy's ranks. Now, if you think that's bad, the Yue tribe, which were even farther south than both Wu and Chu, went and won up both of them. At the Battle of Sui Lu in 496 BC, the Yue army were struggling to break through the Wu lines, until one of the generals had a bright idea. He lined up three detachments of convicts to march in the middle of the two armies, and then he basically told them, Commit suicide now, or we will kill your entire families. Those unfortunate prisoners all followed the order. What that did do, however, was allow the Yue army to march around the Wu lines and attack them from the flanks, as the Wu army watched dumbfounded at this gruesome sight. According to C.J. Piers, and I quote, Southern warfare was waged with a savagery unknown to the Northerners. Casualties were far higher, and the total collapse of Wu and Yue can probably be attributed to the excessive strain on the manpower. End quote. Now he does go on to mention an account that bodies of Wu warriors covered the Chu border like weeds. So yeah, pretty gruesome stuff. Now these things did happen in the north, and what I mean by that is that prisoners were used in the armies, but not as suicide units, but more like a labour corps. So if a river was in the way of the army, it would be the prisoners who built the bridge for the army to cross over it. Obviously, basically they were in the engineering projects for the armed forces. Now like I mentioned before, if you google a map of the Warren States period, then you will find different states. However, by 260 BC, the states and their sizes stayed roughly the same up until unification. Now, there were only seven left, contending to rule all under heaven, or Tianxia. You had, in no particular order, the state of Yan, Qi, Chu, Qin, Han, Wei, and Zhao. They were all fighting, all backstabbing, and all trying to outperform each other economically. This is when all of the states, through one way or another, really tried to gear up the entire resources of the state simply for war. And I'm talking from the kings right the way down to the farmers. All citizens of the state had to play their part, so to speak. Historian El Fung goes on to say, and I quote, During the Warren States period, warfare was the most important aspect of social life, the principle of the state and the compass that directed government policies. It is no exaggeration that by the late Warren States period, 3rd century BC, war had escalated to the level that the entire state was organised for the very purpose of war. And this was true for all states. End quote. So there you go. I didn't get the idea from thin air. Historians agree that during this time, the states all focused on war, and that was it. Everything had something to do with how they could win this war. And then this is where the technology side of things comes into it. So I already mentioned one which is iron, a stronger and more resourceful metal than bronze, so it was a win-win. Now, what weapons could be created with iron and not bronze? Good question. But it's not about the weapons themselves, it's more about the scale at which they could be produced. However, I am going to give an honorary mention to chariots. 
Chariots may have had their heyday during the Western Joe period, but the Warren's Days period would see their decline into non-essential war machines. Now from what I read, there could be three reasons for this. The first is that chariots needed a large open plain where the running was good in order for them to be effective units. But during this time, the ideas to fight a pitched battle were completely different, or at the window, thanks to the art of war. If you're a southern army, mostly composed of infantry, why would you go into an open plain where the enemy has plenty of chariots? That's an insane idea. So the rules of war began to change, is what I'm trying to say. The second reason was that chariots were beginning to be replaced by regular good old cavalry. People realised that if you simply put a person on a horse's back, rather than make it drag a carriage, the horse could run faster. Who would have thought? Okay, that may have been an exaggeration, but you get the point. Cavalry replaced chariots towards the end of this period. And the final reason, it can be argued, was the development of the crossbow in China by a, na- a man named Qin Shu in the state of Chu at around 600 BC, kind of that range, so to speak. At first, these weapons were used primarily to defend settlements due to their slow reload rate. However, as time progressed, they were used actively in military conquests. So what did the crossbow have to do with the decline in use of chariots? Well, the reason was that the crossbow could shoot further than the bow and arrow, at a range of about 600 paces. But more importantly, it was the crossbow's deadly piercing damage which made it so much more effective. Now, if you had a chariot in the thick of battle, all one would need to do is shoot a crossbow at the slow-moving carriage, and the arrow could pierce the carriage and kill the ones occupying it. It's a big target, and it was slow. So yeah, a decent crossbow marksman couldn't miss it. It could be assumed then that the crossbow played a huge role in military developments of the time, and even in later times such as the Han Dynasty, who made lethal use of the crossbow. But we are getting ahead of ourselves here. Now, other weapons that were developed during this time were swords. And I'm not talking about swords of bronze or anything. I'm talking about your everyday sword you see on the movies. Now, these swords were pretty short, but that's because it favoured close-up and personal combat. So, yeah, it kind of makes sense. It was nothing like the Scottish broadswords that you picture Highlanders using when they fought their neighbours to the south. That being said, though, it doesn't mean that they were less effective. With the swords came the overwhelming numbers of infantry that were used in these armies. The infantry were the bread and the butter of the army, and everyone knew it. So the focus moved away from small numbers of expensive, useless charioteers to huge numbers of cheap, reliable infantry units. That being said, swords weren't the only things in use. You also had spear infantry, which had evolved from the dagger axes, and now they were more reliable halberd units, as opposed to dagger axes. And as well as that, the spear lengths were usually shortened from their dagger axe counterparts. And again, it was to compensate for overcrowded battlefields. So that's that. You have the troop numbers and the technology that they used, roughly. Now. I've already mentioned battles as examples, but I want to go a bit further than that and really try my best to simulate a battle. The battle I'm going to focus on for today's podcast is the Battle of Mali, or in Chinese, Mali in Zhejiang. I've picked this battle as it had a very unusual strategy, which proved extremely effective. And for further reference, to build more of an ambiance, so to speak. I'm going to say Wei Guo, Han Guo, Qi Guo, rather than State of Wei, etc. Guo in Chinese means country or state. So I think it's better to use it here. But without further ado, let's get into the battle.
is the year 341 BC, and Wei Guo have set their sights on their neighbours to the west, Han Guo. Now, the thing is, the Wei army had a bit of a problem. Firstly, the Han were allied with Qi Guo, and if the campaign dragged out for too long, no doubt Qi Guo would set aid. Regardless, the commanders Pang Juan and Crown Prince Shen led their mighty army of 100,000 men to attack Han Guo, and attack they did. The Wei army had swept through Han territory like a hot knife through butter, and it seemed nobody could stop them. But at the city of Dalian, they finally managed to break the ground. The leaders of Qi were more than happy to help, and sent out two generals, Tianji and Sun Bin, with 100,000 men to help their allies. A great battle was about to commence. Sun Bin knew that General Pan Juan of the Wei army thought of Qi soldiers as weak and insignificant, so he wanted to take advantage of that. When the Qi army arrived, they attacked the Wei army, which was besieging Dalian, but then quickly ran away, which fed into the idea that the Qi army was weak in Pan Juan's mind. Hmm, the Qi army really are weak. We will conquer Han Guo in no time, an excited Pan Juan told Crown Prince Shen. Within the Qi camp, after the failed attack, Sun Bi put his strategy into motion. He told his counterpart Tianji to light 100,000 stove fires tonight, but tomorrow only light 50,000, then the next day 20,000. The Wei army will be tricked into thinking our army is deserting us. The orders were carried out, and across in the Wei camp, Pan Juan seen fewer and fewer campfires each night. On the first night, there was 100,000. On the second night, only 50,000. And on the third night, only 20,000. The Qi army is disintegrating, he thought to himself. And after seeing only enough stove fires for around 20,000 men, he thought now was the time to attack and annihilate the Qi army. When the morning came around, Pan Juan quickly ordered his 20,000 elite cavalry to form the vanguard, whilst Prince Shen would only make the centre of the army with the 80,000 infantry. Pan Juan marched full haste towards the Qi army, or what he thought was left of it. The Qi army ran along the road as quickly as they could, abandoning their art artillery units and a lot of equipment in order to get away from their pursuers. The chase had went on all day, and eventually the Wei army approached the pass and Mali, at dusk, began to set in. The general ordered his men to stop, as he noticed a tree that had its bark ripped off, with writing on it. Pan Juan ordered some men to hold fires at the tree, so he could read it. The writing on the tree said, Pan Juan si yu te shu jiu xia. In other words, Pan Juan will die under this tree. Just as the general finished reading the words, an arrow zipped through the air and struck him dead. <coughs> the Wei warriors were completely stunned. Where did the arrow come from? But by then, it was too late. In the hills surrounding the pass, the Qi army were lying in wait. Arrows soared through the air and bared down on the completely helpless troops. Men at the front line were desperate to flee the oncoming attack and try to run over their comrades behind them. But it didn't matter. 
as the Qi army had laid caltrops behind them as they entered the pass. Horses got caught in them, men got caught in them. It soon got so bad that Wei soldiers began to run over their dead comrades in the mud in order to try and get away. But the Qi army had already sealed off the pass, making it an arena of death. The Qi army cut out every Wei soldier they could find, butchering their way through until the last man perished. By the time dawn broke, an army of 100,000 men had been completely annihilated, whilst their enemy came away with less than 5,000 casualties. Later that day, Sun Bin found Pang Juan's body and buried him under the tree where he wrote that deadly message. As well as that, Prince Shen was captured and Wei Guo was never in a position to ever try and dominate all under heaven. And soon, both Qi Guo and Qin Guo, which was to the west of Wei Guo, took advantage of the weakened Wei state and gobbled up most of their territory. So there you have it. Here is one battle simulation I thought I'd cover for you. It's crazy, right? Have a strategy such as leaving stove fires to trick your enemy could be so effective. And this strategy became known as the strategy of reducing stove fires to entice the enemy. Well, I think that's it. It's something like that. But you get the idea. But... In case any of you guys missed the point here, what Sun Bin did, essentially, was lure his enemy into a false sense of security and then entice them into an ambush site. Clever play, Sun Bin. Clever play. So basically what happened was Sun Bin pretended to be running away and lured them into Mali, where he'd set up an ambush. And the rest is history. But like I said, this is one of many battles. In the famous book describing this era in history, Jiangguo. And in the book, there are more than 600 battles recorded in this time period. With And all of these armies were colossal in size. Now I did mention the state of Qin right at the end there, and I tried to keep him out of the picture as much as possible, as next week's podcast is going to be all about the rise of the state of Qin, which would result in China's first unification. And that is a wrap for this week's episode. I hope you've enjoyed the content, and if you did, please be sure to leave a review somewhere for me, whether it's on Apple Podcasts or on Facebook. But until next time, thanks for listening.